Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's really wonderful to uh, welcome you to University Libraries. My name is Janet Clark. I'm the Associate Dean for Research and User Engagement at University Libraries. And um, I know this is going to be a great event because the Dean of Students just walked in. Hi, Rick. Um, I, I, uh, before we get started, I just uh, want to uh, talk about the wonderful collaboration this event has been um, with campus and external partners. So I'd like to uh, recognize all the collaboration. Uh, first, to begin with uh, Rachel Wolf and um, with Artworks Project of Chicago that um, uses um, art to discuss and um, um, tackle social uh, social justice issues, and um, it's, and it's a second collaboration with them. We're really thrilled. We are also um, um, partnering with the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Intercultural Initiatives D three, um, and uh, the Chief Diversity Officer um, Judy Brown Clark. Latin American and Caribbean Studies Center um, is also a partner here. Um, and Hispanic Heritage Month Committee. So as you can see, this is a really wonderful campus-wide um, uh, collaboration. And what I'd like to do is um, read to you um, a, a welcoming remarks from the Dean of Libraries, Kareem Bogida. Uh, he wanted me to share these welcome remarks with you. Today I am away at uh, attending an event representing our university. I really miss being with you. One of the reasons I love my new job at Stony Brook University is seeing the university uh, libraries organizing events like this. So I am delighted to welcome all of you here for this important and timely discussion. Deportation and immigration policies impact families and workers on Long Island, New York, and all across the country. This issue is not just a Latino issue, it affects us all as a community. Today's photo exhibit and panel discussion illustrate the critical role that university libraries have at the university, that is, to contribute to and facilitate intellectual and cultural dialogue on issues of local, national, and international topics. We are especially proud to be hosting this event in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month as it exemplifies our deep commitment to diversity, inclusion, equity, and access in our collections, spaces, services, and certainly campus engagement. In fact, dialogue, sharing, respect for one another, learning from each other, and celebrating our unique diversities are necessary to civil society now more than ever. Um, thank you for coming together to engage, engage with, learn from, and support our community of scholars, artists, activities, uh, activists, critics, and advocates. Enjoy the program and please join us for future events. So uh, that's the remarks from uh, Dean. And it is now my um, utmost pleasure, you just walked in right on time, <laughs> to um, welcome um, Dr. Judy uh, Brown-Clark, the Vice President of Equity and uh, Inclusion, to the podium for her welcoming remarks. We just thank you for the wonderful support that you've given this program, so thank you. I apologize for being, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm the taller Clark. <laughs> um, this is so exciting for me. What an absolutely wonderful opportunity to hear your rich contributions. And I just love this opportunity to come together, to, to hear from experts, to ask questions, and to share. That's the whole point of, of the balance of, of being here at the institution is to learn, to grow, and to explore, to get your questions answered. I hope at the point 
where all the, um, the presentation is finished and the dialogue is finished and it's interaction time for you to ask your question. And the second? Oh, um, if there's an opportunity you know, to ask your questions, please, please ask your questions and, and ask the questions that um, just know that there's somebody else that gets informed by it. So, so please take this opportunity. It's absolutely my pleasure from the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Intercultural Initiatives to uh, provide these kind of opportunities. And so I am so excited to hear what everybody has to say, and I'm gonna take my seat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Um, all right, now I am so um, excited to um, introduce our moderator for today, uh, Lori Flores. Dr. Lori Flores is Associate Professor of History and teaches classes in US Latinx, labor, immigration, and food history. She is the author of the award-winning book, Grounds for Dreaming, Mexican Americans, Mexican Immigrants, and the California Farm Worker Movement, and co-editor of the newly revised edition of the Academic, Academics Handbook. She's currently writing a new book on the history of Latinx food workers in the U.S. Northeast from World War II to COVID, which has received support from the Russell Sage and Rockefeller Foundations. Dr. Um, Dr. Flores. Thank you so much uh, to Dean Clark. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, one of the reasons I love doing events like this is because I get to meet new people at the university. It's been such a pleasure to work with um, the libraries on this event, to reunite with colleagues who I've known for a while, and, um, and people who I've admired and haven't gotten to work with yet. So thank you all for being here. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce our panelists in the order that they'll um, be speaking. And after a few minutes of remarks from each of them, um, we'll have a more organic conversation. And like Dean Clark said, we encourage you to ask questions. This is um, an issue that affects all of us, and it's a nationwide issue and one that is global in scale as well. Um, I wanted to start by introducing our photographer of this beautiful, um, beautifully heartbreaking exhibit that we have here at the library, Rachel Wolf. Um, Rachel Wolf is an award-winning photographer and visual storyteller whose work aims to intimately show aspects of humanity intersecting with economic and social issues. She graduated from Ithaca College with a BA in Documentary Studies and has photographed for multiple venues including the New York Times, Time Magazine, The Washington Post, CNN, and The Wall Street Journal. Uh, she was selected as one of Art Pill's 30 Under 30 Women Photographers in 2019. And this is actually her second photo exhibit at Stony Brook. In 2018, we celebrated her and exhibited her work. If you scan the QR code along the wall here, you'll be able to see that first uh, part of this series, uh, which was also called Deported, but a different subtitle, An American Division. And this one takes a look more intimately at a family. Uh, after Rachel speaks, we'll hear from Nancy Heemstra, who's an associate professor in women's gender and sexuality studies here at Stony Brook. She is a political and cultural geographer, and her scholarship focuses on migration in and from Latin America, the U.S. detention and deportation system, and immigration enforcement industries. Emphasis on the industries. It's a whole web. Um, she is the author of a fantastic book that I recommend you check out, Detain and Deport, The Chaotic U.S. Immigration Enforcement Regime. Uh, next, we'll hear from Scally, uh, so, I'm so sorry, Sally Scott Sabo. Um, she is a lecturer in Hispanic languages and literatures and teaches Spanish language courses and classes about Latin American history and current events. Her past research has focused on the fight for recognition and justice for human rights violations during Spain and Guatemala's civil wars and dictatorships. She currently focuses on the Northern Triangle and immigration and is a legal screening volunteer for unaccompanied minors held at US migrant and detention centers. And we'll be hearing more about that work. Um, and finally, to my uh, far left, we have Luis Valenzuela. He's an alum of Stony Brook School of Social Welfare 
and started his career as a social worker with the Puerto Rican Family Institute and later moved into the field of child welfare policies. He currently works for the Healthcare Education Project as the Long Island region's healthcare advocate. Uh, among his many, many community volunteer positions and posts, he serves on the Suffolk County Human Rights Commission and is the volunteer executive director of the Long Island Immigrant Alliance. So, so much talent to my left here um, and to your right. So I'm so pleased to uh, to have them all here today and we'll begin with Rachel. Tell us a little bit about um, this exhibit. All right, can you all hear me okay? Um, I apologize, there's a little bit of a delay so I was clapping after everyone because of that. So um, I'm going to show some work and talk a little bit about this family and the, the story. Um, and just also first want to say thank you everyone for being here and for coming to learn more, um, both about this family and the policies. Thank you to Janet, to Stony Brook University, Artworks Projects, and for everyone coming again. So um, I'm going to share my, my screen now and show some images. Just one moment. Okay, so I hope it's working. I won't. I can't hear anyone <laughs> except for myself. Um, so I'm going to show some photos and talk about this family. Um, so I met this family. This is the Quintana Salazar family. I met them. Uh, in 2017, and I met them weeks before Lourdes was deported. Uh, this photo is Lourdes and her husband, Luis. They have three U.S.-born children, Brian, Luis, and Pamela, and they lived in the U.S. for many, many years. I met them, as I said, already in 2017, five years ago, and it was at the time when uh, Lourdes was about to be deported, and so they were looking to get their story out, which is how I connected with them, that they were trying to get their story out to people so that people would understand what they're going through. And at the moment, at the time, they were trying to fight her deportation. She had been given stays of deportation for years uh, and lived in the U.S. for 20 years. So this photo shows the photo of Lourdes and her three kids when they were children and younger. And it also shows Brian, the youngest son, uh, looking at that photo that Lourdes had sent her husband in Mexico. Um, so Luis was deported in 2010. And so Lourdes raised the three kids in Michigan for most of their childhood. And they sent that photo to him because he couldn't come back to the US after he was deported. This was Brian seeing that photo for the first time in 2018 in Mexico. and. They are a lovely family, an amazing family. Um, they had the community rally around them and try to uplift them at the time when she was going to be deported. This was again in 2017. So I'm showing some work right now just to give some context to the images that are around you on the walls. And these are meant to show what also was exhibited in 2018 in the same space. So this was obviously a very difficult moment for her, for the family, and to also be there for her. Uh, this was the moment that she found out that she was going to be deported in 2017, and they had to move really quickly at that time. They had built a life in Michigan. Again, they lived there for 20 years. The kids grew up there. They're all U.S. born, and what they grew up with and what they know is the U.S. So they, in this image, Brian is it, it was like a childhood school book that they didn't need anymore. And so they set up a little fire to burn some things. And this was hours after she found out that she was going to be deported. This is Pamela, the eldest daughter. Um, they were all U.S. citizens again, and other children were. And here, they're at the consulate applying for the kids to become Mexican-American citizens to be able to travel back and forth. And this image is another one that is extremely difficult for the family and to be there for. Um, so Lourdes went to reunite with her husband again, 
in Mexico, um, and this was again in 2017. Her youngest children went with her, Brian and Louise, and Pamela, the eldest daughter, stayed back in Michigan. So in this moment, Lourdes is going through the security line with her two children, and Brian got called back. He heard his name, and his teacher came running, reunited, crying, um, and it was... I think it was an extremely difficult moment for, for everyone. They went to Mexico, and that's where they Brian went to school and Louise went to school for years. Um, and Pamela stayed back in the U.S. to finish her education at Michigan State University. Brian adjusted and went to school, and this is him playing soccer at his school during the recess. And something that I also want to touch on is that uh, the years that Lourdes was in the U.S. were also difficult for her in other ways. She had to miss her father's funeral. Um, this is her mother, and this is her father's grave in Mexico. Because she was here and getting states of deportation, she couldn't go back to Mexico when her father passed away. And I think it shows something that is also sacrificed to make these choices to try to come to the U.S. and choose a better life for her kids that she wanted to give them. And this family, I, they have so much love. I just also want to emphasize that. They are an extremely loving and caring family. Um, and they've, they've been through so much. And they still are an incredibly kind, just generous, loving family. Um, the two, the kids, again, had to grow up primarily without their father. And then being back in Mexico also reintroduced um, a, like an ability to be able to be together again. Um, but Louise, the middle daughter here, decided that she wanted to finish high school in the US. Um, that's what she knew. And that was an extremely difficult decision for her. Here she was registering for classes in the US while she was still in Mexico and surrounded by photos of her and her friends growing up. Um, and they, they built a life that she they already had in Mexico. She adjusted, but then they decided that it was time to come back. And the other thing that I think is important to touch on is that they Lourdes feels that she has missed a lot of moments, and that is extremely hard on them. She couldn't be there for Pamela graduating. This is Pamela holding a FaceTime uh, connection with her mom, dad, and brother who were in Mexico at the time. And Louise, the middle daughter at prom, where she couldn't be, Lourdes couldn't be there with her. And this family separation is not by choice. That's another thing that's, I think, super important to emphasize is that they, she wanted to be there. All this family wants is to be together. And these are the photos that you all will see on the walls around you. Um, this year, in 2022, I went to Mexico as Brian, the eldest, or sorry, Brian, the youngest son, graduated high school. Um, so I met them 2017, and now all these years later, he is figuring out what he's going to do next. This is Louis setting up for his graduation party, and this is Brian in line to graduate. Um, he felt so, I think, excited, excited to graduate, but I think his mom felt much more excited for him, um, as you can see in the joy in her face. It was, it was a beautiful moment to see how excited she was, and how proud she was, and just how far they've come as well. Um, but what's hard, and I think what she's emphasized to me, is that they don't know, he doesn't know what he's going to do. And because of the, all the unknowns that they are still just wanting to be together, it's hard to navigate normal life, just life things and decisions, big decisions even. Um, with this family separation in the background, with them wanting to reunite and just be together. And so much time has passed. When the beginning of this slideshow, Brian was, was way younger, five years younger. And now he's 18, shaving and getting ready to go to graduation. Um, and I think that the, the real big point here is that this family just wants to be together. They are non-criminals and they fought to try to just be together. That is the bottom line in this, and that they have a lot of love for one another. And here this is Florida's hugging her middle daughter, Louise, when she visited for Brian's graduation this summer. Um, so that's all that I'm going to show right now. Thank you all for being here again. And 
apologies if there's any delays in my responses to questions because I will have a delay, I believe. But then I'm going to stop my screen share and then let someone else chat about themselves as well. Thank you. So much, Rachel. Um, before we do hear from the others, uh, I have one sort of quick question for you that, that could spark more questions down the line or conversation with the audience. So, I mean, you can't be here with us today, but we have been milling around and looking at the photos here. And something that really strikes me is the decisions you make as a photographer, how to exhibit and order, put in order the different pictures and your work. Um, and how you decide which photographs end up being shown together. And something I was noticing, and if you haven't gotten to look at them during the reception, you definitely can, is in a lot of the photos, the family members are, their gazes are somewhere else, right? They're not directly at the camera. So they might be looking off to the side, they might be looking down, they might be looking at something in the distance. But if you step back and you see the total effect of all of that, it's almost as if across distance, the family members are looking at each other, even though they might not be in the same place at the same time. So someone might be dancing at their prom and it looks as if they might be looking at their dad who's dancing at a quinceanera in Mexico, right? And the daughter's in Michigan or the brother is shaving and it, he could be looking at his sister in Michigan taking a rest on her couch. So are those decisions intentional, the way that you try to show that they're sort of looking off to something else or someone else? What were your feelings behind the poses or the moments that you wanted to capture in this exhibit? Yeah, I, I love that take and thank you for, for explaining that so beautifully. I think that's a wonderful way to, to phrase it. And then something so beautiful about um, an exhibit is that this space allows those kinds of explorations and understandings of these images. Um, and so when I'm working with this family, I'm photographing them that are going about their lives. And so I, I don't want them to look at me because I don't want me, I don't want myself to be part of the equation. Um, the only one that I have them, or the only ones where they're looking at me are the portraits where I've asked them specifically to look at me and try to make a deeper connection with the camera and the audience. But yeah, I, I want people to, to both see the, the love and connection that they have and then also make the connection that you just did um, about, about the distance and that there's kind of that sentiment and communication with, between the photos. So that was beautifully said and a great question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure people will have more for you towards the end. Um, but turning to uh, Professor Kimstra, um, who's an expert in immigration policy and the ways that it's uh, affected people, both in the U.S. and in Latin America, uh, I'd like you um, to just discuss what do you think has changed in U.S. immigration policy, um, specifically around detention and deportation between the time of Rachel's first exhibit here in 2018 and the one we're seeing now. Thank you very much, Laurie, and thank you for the invitation to be on this panel. Um, and thank you very much to the library and to all the organizations who have made this event happen. Um, and Rachel, I just really want to thank you, too, for um, coming back to this family and taking these photos, because this, this type of work is so important for making these huge numbers that we hear about detention and deportation and what often just seems as this kind of remote, massive system and things argued about by politicians to really make it see, make people, allow people to see how that impacts people, um, humans, families, our communities, right? It is this kind of vast, um, it has these, these very, very many effects, um, embodied effects um, in so many different ways. Um, and so when I, you know, I was on this panel when the exhibit was here in 2018, and now to see these photos again, um, 
it's it's just so heart wrenching, right? You see these stories, um, this these these very difficult um, experiences. They just extend in time. They don't stop. It's not as if deportation happens um, and it's over, right? It continues. It will continue for people's entire lives. So I think an important thing to remember is that these policies often just made um, on a whim of a politician or to get a, to try to get a vote um, uh, or to get a political donation. You know, they have these long, long reverberations. Um, so when I think about what's different between 2018 and now, well, some things have changed and some things are really not that different at all. Um, you can look at some raw numbers in terms of um, um, detention. For example, in 2018, um, at that time, there were 42,000 people detained on a daily basis um, around the, the country. Um, that actually went up after 2018 to around 52,000 people per day. Um, it dropped during the pandemic, really only due to the pandemic and desires to, to kind of um, um, lower the number of people contained in these um, um, in detention centers, which the, um, the horrific way in which COVID was dealt with in detention centers is, is, <laughs> is another um, topic which we, we could talk about. Um, but then today, again, these numbers are increasing. Um, most uh, In September, the numbers were up to 25,000 people um, detained per day. And the infrastructure that we have to detain people remains the same. We still have the capacity to detain 52 to 55,000 people per day in terms of contracts that the U.S. government has with different facilities, over 200 facilities to detain people. So we still have that capacity to detain that. Even under the Biden administration, um, that has not, um, for the most part, decreased. Another thing to think about is that while our numbers for detention um, today are down, um, we now have um, uh, over 300,000 people um, in what are called alternatives to detention. Right? So these are ways of monitoring and surveilling people not in detention centers. Um, but that is nearly four times the number of what it was in 2018. So we still have more, even more people involved, uh, involved in some type of detention and monitoring than we did in um, 2018. So in many ways, the, the system of, um, of keeping track of people has gotten even bigger. Okay, um, if we look at numbers of deportation, um, in 2018, um, about 256,000 people were deported. Um, and I, I want to make the point that um, the year, uh, the highest number of yearly deportations actually took place under President Obama. It was about 400,000 um, in one year. Um, so um, the numbers for uh, 2021 were just 59,000 of deportations, but we had a record high number of people that were turned away um, at the border under things like the Title 42, health exclusions, um, just denying people the right to seek asylum. Um, and those, uh, just last week, the, the Biden administration announced a new application of Title 42 um, in terms of how they're going to use that to expel Venezuelans who are, are at the border. So we see these policies um, for um, trying to regulate who is and is not um, in, the, in the country. These continue to be expanded in these um, I guess we could say very creative ways um, by by policymakers. So while the tone of white, what uh, might be being said by certain political leaders might shift depending on who is in power and political um, political parties who is saying it, the infrastructure remains the same, right? And a lot of times these logics remain the same, right? Um, political uh, immigration policies continue to be made um, to get votes, right? And to make money. I mean, one thing that um, Lori mentioned that I, I do work on is looking at the industries involved in detention and deportation. 
these are billion dollar industries, right? People making money on um, detaining people. The, the US government pays um, county facilities, private facilities, um, an average of about $170 per day um, to detain somebody. Um, so you have facilities and private companies making money, not just those, those particular incarceration companies, but food industries, medical companies, security companies. Um, there's a whole range of people that come to depend on these industries. Um, and they, they really are industries. Um, and the lobbying money behind the, the maintenance of detention and deportation monies, uh, de de um, policies is just incredible. It's very hard to track. But there is a lot of money put into keeping these policies in place. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I, I think um, exhibits like this, um, this type of work is just so important to um, make, uh, to really show us um, um, visually, kind of viscerally, right, how these policies we often just hear talked about um, and bargained over, lobbied over, how they are really experienced um, by people in these ways that just reverberate out through through time and space. In the United States, across borders, um, really um, um, in many, many different places. So, thank you. Very well said. Uh, Sally, you, as I mentioned before, you've been a volunteer legal screener for unaccompanied minors mm -hmm. at migrant detention centers. So tell us more about that work. Who are you doing it with? Um, what have you experienced in terms of these real people who are going through these sufferings? Oops, sorry. Is this working? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Thank you for the incredible photographs. And I'm going to touch on them a little bit while I, while I present. Uh, thank you to the library. Thank you for all of you that are here today. So for this very important function. So a couple of weeks ago, I did spend some time here in the library with these photos of Lourdes Salazar Bautista and her husband, Luis, and their children, Brian, Luis, and Pamela. Certainly there is, is a history of disbelief, angu anguish, and togetherness denied, conveyed through Rachel Wolf's acute and compassionate photographic eye. Thank you for that. The Mexico-U.S. border is an entanglement of confusing and broken immigration policies, stagnation, and violence. The border is often a place of shattered dreams. It is a generator of forever scars. In March 2020, the Trump administration invoked Title 42, which you mentioned. Okay. This law allows the Center of Disease Control to prohibit the entry of people into the U.S. when there is a serious danger of the introduction of a communicable disease. Dr. Anthony Fauci has argued against the measure, declaring in a CNN interview last year that, quote, the problem is within our own country. Focusing on immigrants, expelling them is not the solution to an outbreak, end quote. Activists, myself included, maintain that Title 42 was not invoked as a means of disease prevention or containment, but as a way to keep certain human beings out of the U.S. In fact, Title 42 targets people from Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and recently Haitians and Venezuelans. According to the American Immigration Council, between March 2020 and May 2022, close to two million expulsions have occurred due to Title 42, sending people back across the Mexican border or into ICE detention centers until they are flown home without the chance to have a credible fear interview and advocate for asylum. It is estimated that up to half of the expulsions consist of people who have made two or more attempts to cross the border. Although the Biden administration attempted to end Title 42 this past spring, it remains in effect. In May of 22, 2022, a federal judge in Louisiana ruled that the CDC must go through a formal process in order to lift the law. Nevertheless, since February 2021, unaccompanied minors, children under 18 years of age who crossed the Mexican-U.S. border without their parents, have been exempt from Title 42. They can stay and seek asylum. It is those children that are my story. In the spring of 2021, I began serving as a legal intake volunteer, interviewing unaccompanied minors, children that have crossed the border without their parents, that are held at juvenile detention centers in Texas. 
I work with Raices, a nonprofit agency that provides free and low cost legal services to underserved immigrant children, families, and refugees. Since my plans to help out at the border in person were derailed by the pandemic, I was very happy to begin volunteering with Raices, interviewing detained children via Zoom. The children are guided to a special room in the detention center that is equipped with Wi-Fi and a computer, and we are connected for a Zoom chat. After trying to make them feel comfortable by being silly or showing them my big fat orange cat, I ask them about their lives and their country of origin and their journey to the U.S. I also ask them about the relative that they plan on staying with here in the U.S. As this relative needs to be contacted, provide paperwork, and be approved, before the child is released to their care. While I converse with the children in Spanish, I transcribe the interview in English. After the interview, my transcription is reviewed by a team of lawyers. Raices then tries to match them with an immigrant lawyer, immigration lawyer in the state that these children are going to reside. Asylum seekers with lawyers are five times more likely to win their cases. Asylum seekers are not guaranteed a government-funded lawyer and therefore often struggle to find legal representation. In 2020, 20, in 2021, only one third of asylum seekers in the US won their court cases. Most of the children that I interview are from Central America, specifically Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. As you might be aware, these nations are plagued by gang violence, corruption, impunity, and poverty. Due to Title 42, only unaccompanied children from these nations are permitted to seek asylum in the U.S. Therefore, these children are oftentimes leaving mothers, fathers, grandparents, or adult siblings. They're leaving them behind for a chance for safety, for food and shelter, and to attend school. Why did you come to the United States? The gang told me that if I did not join them, they would kill me. They held a knife to my stomach. They kept waiting outside of my house. Why did you come to the United States? There's not enough food for all of us. Why did you come to the United States? My family does not have money for me to attend school. Why did you come to the United States? My mother threw me out of the house as I was raped and I'm pregnant. Why did you come to the United States? I have no parents and my grandmother's too sick to care for me. Why did you come to the United States? I noticed that this individual looks older than 18. I ask him his age, he's 20. Therefore, he should be in an adult detention center. I contacted Raisi's paralegal via Slack. After the paralegal enters the Zoom and begins informing the man about what might happen to him, ICE officers enter the Zoom room and they take him away. The paralegal's in tears. Why did you come to the United States? The land is too dry to grow crops. My dad is already here and the both of us will send money back to my family to survive. Why do you come? Why did you come to the United States? I just want my mom. She's nine years old and I can't stop her tears. When I interview these children, being a mother, I often think of the parent or caregiver left behind in a home country. I cannot fathom the anxiety and grief of sending my child north approximately 2,000 miles, not knowing when or if I will see them again. The photo of Lourdes over there, where she's supporting her chin on her hand as she's contemplating leaving her children, reminds me of the parents or caregivers that these children have left behind. I cannot imagine what is worse, the days before the goodbye, the goodbye itself, or the raw emptiness once the child is gone. Parents, care caregivers, and friends know that the, country, that the journey through Mexico is a perilous one. Migrants are at risk of violence at the hands of gangs, drug traffickers, human traffickers, and thieves. One 16-year-old boy told me, quote, Mexico is the tierra de dolores, or the land of pain. While traveling through Mexico, he escaped from drug traffickers with a blow to the head. They tried to recruit him to sell drugs, only later to be kidnapped by the Satas, who released him and then he basically was re uh, released from them after receiving a hefty ransom from his already financially strapped parents. A couple of children have reported to me that they were robbed by Mexican police. These children were not at all faced or surprised to have been robbed by a law enforcement officer, as insecurity and uncertainty are their norm. 
Children at juvenile detention centers usually stay from 10 days to a month before they are united with a family member here in the U.S. While at the detention center, they have access to classes, crafts, some outside time, chill time, food, clothing, medical care, and a social worker. One of our jobs is to make sure that the children have access to clean clothing and adequate food at the shelter, and that they feel as comfortable as possible given the circumstances. As mentioned earlier, insecurity and uncertainty are the norm for most of these children. Overall, they seem contented to be in a safe place where they have access to three meals a day. I'm amazed by the courage, strength, maturity, and good-naturedness of these children, who despite their often tragic pasts, their risky journeys to the U.S., and being held in a detention center in a strange land, nearly always greet and say goodbye to me with a smile. At the end of our interview, when they disappear from Zoom view, I pause and reflect upon their story, and I hope for their happiness. A minute or two later, I hear the door open to the, the detention center's Zoom room, and I take a deep breath. There is another young face in front of me, waiting for my silly jokes and my huge fat orange cat. Thank you so much for that, Sally. Uh, Luis, your background is, um, amongst other things, in social work, in human rights advocacy, in healthcare. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, um, in your you know, many years of work and seeing people at very different stages of their lives and um, especially when it comes to the issue of immigrant families, mixed status families being um, divided in this way. What, in your opinion, your expert opinion, are the health effects of these kinds of policies, both on one's physical health, but also mental and emotional health, too? Hello? Well, uh... As everyone else has, has said, thank you uh, for this presentation. Uh, it's very moving. Uh, it, as moving as it is, uh, it represents the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. It is immigration policy uh, remains a threat uh, to all of it. So there are about 18 million children who reside in a family uh, with at least one foreign-born parent who's either naturalized, uh, legal permanent resident, or undocumented. And what happens is that whenever there is a deportation uh, that's made public, for example, here in Suffolk County, which was ground zero for anti-immigrant sentiment, we had a raid and 300 uh, people were taken. Um, and the justification was that they were looking for gang members and anyone who they found in an address that supposedly belonged to a, a gang member was taken. Uh, and so that has consequences beyond the act. Uh, the consequences range from the physical, the emotional, the developmental, and economic. Uh, so talking about uh, immigration enforcement, uh, you know, I think you call it the, the immigration, immigration regime. You can call it a deportation regime. But immigration enforcement has a wider effect than just those who come into contact with immigration. Uh, families who, who reside in immigrant, fa in immigrant families uh, are uncertain or afraid uh, or terrorized. I had testified here in the uh, legislature that the ICE and police who raided the homes here on, on Long Island were essentially terrorists. They terrorized not only the families that 
they impacted, but the whole community across Long Island. And the rage took place from the western tip of Long Island all the way out to the Twin Forks. <clears throat> One of the things that we had to do was get in front of the media uh, before the politicians could get there. And we did. We brought families. Uh, and we brought their children who were left behind. We had negotiated with the media not to show faces of the families that were left behind or the children, not to use their names. Uh, but those family members were so incredibly angry, despite being afraid, terrorized, uh, and depressed, that they wanted to get on camera. They wanted to show their face. Uh, there was a little girl about seven years old, uh, small for, for her age. But the newscaster had asked her, uh, why didn't you go to school? Why are you here? And she said, because I'm afraid if I go to school and I come back, my mom's not going to be here. Uh, even the news uh, caster almost broke down in tears. And so we had to get in front of uh, the media uh, and, and stop uh, the promotion of that type of activity because. When I say that this was ground zero, uh, immigrants were being attacked on a daily basis, not only verbally, uh, but physically. Bottles were thrown at them. They were hit by cars. Uh, kids were chased with uh, chainsaws. People were stabbed. Houses were firebombed. Uh, there were drive-bys in, in a house. Uh, and we had to learn how to respond to this. How, you know, politicians drove the climate. I mean, it, this became a climate affair for the Latino population because immigration was uh, conflated with Latinos. Uh, it was conflated with the undocumented and conflated with criminality. Uh, so not only did, did we have to uh, figure out ways to get our stories into the media, but we also had to figure out ways to deal with uh, the politicians. The, initially, what we were doing was demonstrating, rallying, and all that that did was to bring more attention to the politicians, to bring them more credits. Uh, so we had to figure out how to deal with them. For example, uh, it was a politician who was a moderate who um, passed a couple of, uh, introduced a couple of bills that uh, were anti immigrant, but uh, the underlying sentiment was anti uh, Latino. Uh, and I brought some immigrants with me to speak to him. And when we finished speaking, he called me to the, back, to the side and said, Luis, uh, nobody's going to listen to you. I said, okay. Uh, that was maybe on a Tuesday. By Sunday, he was calling me from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, and we got him to rescind the bill. And it got him to do a press conference and rescind the bill. He had to figure out different ways to deal with this situation. Uh, as you guys might know, uh, the anti-immigrant uh, climate that we lived through here was uh, culminated in the death of an immigrant uh, who was killed because uh, uh, immigrants were not only being assaulted, but they were being robbed. Uh, immigrants, especially undocumented immigrants, were, would carry cash. Uh, they were day laborers. They had money at the end of the day because they would be paid at the end of the day. Uh, so they were being robbed. Uh, and oftentimes when uh, the police were called, the police would chalk it down to youthful disturbances. 
And this is something that we found out uh, after the death because we were dealing with the uh, police department and the um, the uh, defense uh, and, tr and trying to uh, to get things uh, done. But anyway. Uh, it, it culminates with uh, the death of, of this uh, immigrant. But the distinction of being ground zero was taken by uh, Colorado, was it? Arizona, with SB 1070, was a law that they passed. And I can give you some more of the, of the history of uh, Suffolk County, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Physical, emotional, developmental, uh, economic uh, uh, problems uh, are something that's seen as a consequence of, of the fear of immigration policy. So it's not just the the, uh, the deportations, uh, but the whole immigration uh, policy that exerts the greatest uh, effect. Uh, and impacts the greatest number of people. Uh, real quick, uh, there, there are 16 million, almost 17 million people uh, that live with at least one uh, undocumented person. Within that 16 million, there are about 10 million uh, children, 6 million who live with an uh, uh, undocumented family member, and 4.5 four million who live with an undocumented uh, parent. And as I mentioned before, uh, and there are close to 18 million children who live in, uh, in a family in which at least one parent is uh, foreign born, uh, which include, you know, undocumented parent, legal permanent resident, uh, and naturalized citizens. Uh, and that's where the greatest impact occurs. Thank you so much. So as you can see, we have expertise in a lot of different realms and areas. So I want to turn it over to you all in the audience. Um, if you have any comments or questions for any of the four um, people we have up here, um, please raise your hand and we'll come to you with the mic. Can I, give, can I give a quick statement of someone on the uh, on the live stream? Uh, D. Joy Corbett states. Uh, hold on, wait a minute. D. Joy Joy Corbett uh, posted. This is such an important discussion. People don't know what is actually happening to human beings. All right. What I have learned in life, as I keep having birthdays, is this is a small world. This is a really small world. As I, I walk by the pictures very quickly, and as I'm listening to you talk, prior to coming to Stony Brook, I was at Michigan State University, and I know this story. And at the time, I was on city council when we were doing sanctuary cities, and I know that side of the story. And so I, for each and every one of you, as you tell an aspect of this story, which is so complex, and it's, it's just grounded in humanity. It just shows wow, why we're here. I think it's so easy to, to think that, you know, a policy, a politician, um, enforcement has the ability to do such profound damage, generational damage, yet we can't wrap our minds around the converse that one, two, three people can make the equal and opposite positive effect around policy implementation, disruption, and so on. And so I hope 
as questions are being asked and your clarification, your understanding is, is, is this is not bigger than you. You absolutely have the opportunity because you don't know. We absolutely have. We don't know who's even in earshot of what we're saying right now. The opportunity to be a disruptor and to get in some good trouble and to make some meaningful change. But I, I, I'm just sitting here and it's really happenstance. And I say it often, but I, I just so appreciate each and every one of you taking this issue and rotating a little bit so we can see a little bit different. But this is not bigger than us. We absolutely collectively have the ability to address it. Um, what exactly did you do to get the politician to respond? <laughs> well, uh, we had, we had to come at him from uh, not directly. Like, she use the other one. We had to come at him uh, indirectly. So. Uh, we had to threaten his relationship with someone who was a lot more important, uh, who had national aspirations, and, and um, I, I don't want to name the politician. Uh, but it's, and if I give any more information, it'll be easily identifiable. But he's on social media today, uh, you know, talking against the uh, restrictions. Uh, so hopefully uh, that encounter helped to uh, put them on a different path. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, I'll add something. Um, it's been really an honor to bring this topic here to the libraries. And I, um, uh, you know, what you said, Judy, um, um, resonates with me because it is a small world. And one of the, my, the, um, my take on it is, as an Asian American, um, that this is, you know, um, really about our community together. It's not, as I said in my opening remarks, it's not a Latino issue. It's not just a Latino issue. It affects us all, there are many immigrants in this room and at Stony Brook University, and um, you know, it's to our discredit if we say, oh, that's someone else's issue. And I'm Asian American, therefore it doesn't affect me. That is so not true. And so, uh, you know, it's really the, the um, you know, when we bring ourselves together at, with compassion is when we can get, be stronger together on these kinds of issues. It, it is really a matter, a, a human rights issue. I, I just wanted to add to Lisa's comment because um, he and I were in different spheres at that time, but yet in the same sort of in step with one another. I was sitting with the Human Rights Commission as vice chair, of which now he is a member and a commission member, and I'm chair of the uh, Suffolk County Human Rights Commission. But um, it was an interesting time because the anti immigrant sentiment was only focused on the um, We had Russian, Polish, English um, nannies out east that were undocumented, and all kinds of other individuals on Long Island that were no, by no stretch of the imagination being inflicted upon the pain that we were seeing individuals go through. And it was unfortunate that Marcelo Lucero had to pass, and he became a, a, a victim of that sort of era. Um, I was in Patchogue last night, and I was just blown away every time I go there. The difference in Patchogue from what it was then to what it is today, uh, the community was very welcoming, although we had complaints in the human rights about LGBTQ being um, harassed over their parade and whatever happened in that area, but 
um, it's come a long way, um, but we're by no stretch of the imagination anywhere near where we need to be. Um, I do want to just also address that there's a lot of Latina suicide, young women in many suicide, which is back again in the news. Um, and much of it is as a consequence of some of the trauma that they've all experienced as a consequence of some of what the reason that anyone here has mentioned. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sad that in a place, in a country where we're supposed to be about immigration and bringing folks here, and there's such a huge history of um, everyone, Asian, Latinos, African American, you name it, who have come to this great country and have built it, that we're not welcome as we should be. So I um, just want to congratulate you all for the great uh, I just wanted to, to add something to what you said. So, okay, so in terms of Latina suicide, well, you know, if they're leaving, looking for a better life, because everything is, you know, horrendous where they are, okay, it's, you know, so if they're leaving and they're expecting uh, to, you know, a better place, then they go and then they come here and they are greeted with this race instead of racism, okay, or this lack of welcoming. Um, this atmosphere that certainly they didn't expect. Um, one can understand where they would get so depressed as to think about suicide when, you know, they've left one place looking for a, a better start and then now they're here and they're being persecuted. It's like nothing has changed for them. So. Well, there was one case in the recent one where the mother had committed suicide in, uh, committed suicide in one of the uh, facilities that they've been put in because of the desperation. And that's just one case that is public knowledge to us, right? Um, there's a, a, a host of them that occur like that. Okay, so I love it. So um, I'm a big advocate when it comes to uh, indigenous communities in Latin American countries. I just wanted to ask like, um, I don't see, I don't know if people like mainstream know this, but like, is it true that like indigenous people from Latin American countries are the most, are the ones who immigrate the most to the states? I, I actually don't know official statistics, but I know that the needs in detention centers um, and shelters for indigenous languages is very, very high. Um, because a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think that this is very true, that the pressures pushing people to migrate um, um, from the uh, Northern Triangle countries, um, but also elsewhere, are um, even more acute on indigenous populations because of the systemic racism, discrimination, um, poverty that they face um, the in the places that they're leaving. So I, I don't know about official statistics. I don't know if anybody has that information, but I think that those pressures are very high on indigenous populations. And our um, systems here are woefully, just horribly equipped to, to um, help um, people um, um, from um, those populations. Okay, so what Parises does is when we get a child that doesn't speak Spanish, because most of us are Spanish English translators, as we get connected to a person in Guatemala that speaks indigenous language and, and, and Spanish, and so actually we use that interpreter, and so that interpreter takes my question in Spanish and then actually asks the child in their indigenous language to answer. Um, definitely more vulnerable. I mean, just Guatemala has more than 23 indigenous languages. So you've got a child that's extra vulnerable okay, coming into this country because we think about it, there aren't many ESL programs for, for Kekchi or any of their Maya, Maya languages. So so there's that because they don't know Spanish. Okay, So they're more vulnerable in that, in that regard. Um, you know, as well, climate change is very much affecting the indigenous populations. So what we're seeing is that, for instance, in one of the comments that I said that I got was that we can't grow crops anymore. 
Well, as we know, the indigenous communities are dependent upon agriculture. They're agrarian. So what happens with climate change is that they can't grow their crops anymore. And usually what happens is they immigrate to the cities first to try to find work. A lot of times that doesn't work out either, and that's when they start to cross the border. So it's definitely um, an issue. Um, it's definitely there. We're definitely seeing it, okay, that it's happening, that we are having indigenous people come across. And um, it, it's for a host of reasons, but we're seeing climate change being more part of that equation. The only thing I, I would add is uh, that sometimes there's uh, something positive that comes out of uh, unfortunate situations as I was saying in Spanish, but hard to translate. But some of uh, the children of those communities are, are becoming trilingual. They speak English, they speak Spanish, and they speak Native American uh, languages. So that's uh, uh, a positive thing. It's uh, something that when I first discovered, I was like, wow, that's great. It's, it's uh, a powerful thing. Even though in, in our communities, <laughs> in our social work communities, our advocacy communities, we uh, uh, I promote not talk, not using children as interpreters. Uh, but this is uh, something that is positive and lasts a lifetime. We have a question from a YouTube viewer. Argon 135, what can we do as students to have an impact on this issue? You know, I, I was an undergraduate student here. Uh, I, I was the president of the Latin American Student Association. And during that time, there were a lot of civil wars. They call them civil wars in uh, Latin America, Central America. Uh, and we were able to, to bring people from uh, those countries here to speak to, to students uh, about what was happening in their country. Uh, and as a result of those uh, wars is why we got an uptick in immigration here in the 80s, uh, which is a, when anti-immigrant sentiment starts to to foment here. Uh, towards the end of the 80s, it, it started to die down. And then it uh, increased again during the middle 90s when, as she mentioned, policies, right? NAFTA uh, was passed. And just that one law drew about a million uh, subsistence farmers in Mexico off of their farms, and I think affected like three million people. And what happened? Uh, U.S. subsidized corn was exported to Mexico, and it was cheaper than growing your own corn. So uh, policies have tremendous consequences. Um, I would say just ask those questions. Um, be politically active. Vote. Um, share your knowledge. I think most people, when they hear about consequences, when they see photos like this, when they learn the consequences of policies and get past kind of the, the discourses and the normal ways of talking about things, they're pretty horrified. Not everybody, but most are pretty horrified to learn about conditions of detention, how many people are deported, that they weren't actually criminals, right? And so often just starting conversations with friends in your classes, with family members, and not just buying into the narratives um, that you're told um, can really make a difference, right? Um, look at lobbying. Um, try to uh, find out what is behind the policies just being proposed and raise those questions, really. In all at all levels um, in the things that you do those can be very very powerful um, just making other people aware of what you learn I just want to make sure in case Rachel had anything to say that we um, allow her to do so
Um, thank you. No, I, I agree with everything that you're saying, and I'm just enjoying being here. I also say that another thing people can do is volunteer. Um, look for volunteer opportunities where you can, can help out in your community as well. I just say is talking to that student a small act it doesn't have to be you know um, earth shattering but it's amazing what a small act can do I was just thinking that you know maybe you hear of somebody or your 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 friend or a parent um, who might be going through uh, a struggle or an immigration struggle or somebody uh, you know they're, they're they're being deported or maybe they're in deportation proceedings you know just being there for them just listening to them so I think just doing a small thing like that, just being there for somebody, because I think sometimes it might, especially for a student, it might seem overwhelming because you know you have a lot of your work, you've got your school, your scholastic activities. So, uh, you know, even doing something small like that um, can make an impact. So Rachel, this question is for you. I think what's really important, particularly around history, is archives, and one of the the, the archives that's most compelling is photography. When you capture it, because when you paint, it's a version of, it, it's through your lens. But when you take a picture of something, it is a snatch, it's a snapshot of, of truth. And so can you tell a little bit about, you know, how you've used your camera lens to archive people's truth and using it as uh, an inspiration for action. Oh. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think that I, it's an important thing to not take lightly um, and that I, like with this family and with everything that I do, I want to make sure that they feel accurately represented and feel um, like their voice is in it. And so it's something that um, I, I work with also on daily portraits and everything, but I treat these types of projects and work as a collaboration. Um, and so the family is just as much a part of this as, as the photos and the archive. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a really big responsibility and a lot to, to, to carry on and that I want to make sure that their story is accurately told and accurately heard. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that, it's a great question. Thanks for asking. So um, I was just going to say, like, um, I feel like story read also is not mainstream. Like, we know everyone knows about the War of 1812, like the Mexican American War, and no one really talks about how that impacted indigenous communities around that, or even like. Uh, like mestizo communities, uh, how like all sides of Spanish and what on what happened with those people when the land was divided. Also, um, I have taken a few classes in which like we've seen the impact that the United States has had on, or even like other countries such as Great Britain has had on South America and Central America, uh, the U.S. exploitation, and I don't feel like these people the ones that are like against immigration realize what this country has done to them. So I grew up in Peru. Uh, I was born and raised there. I have been that like what happened and how the United States has affected Chile, how has affected Peru, how has affected like Ecuador. And it's just surprising to me that these politicians that should know the history, they don't know it. So I don't know, like, have they ever, like, thought about it? Like, has there, any, has there, have, has there been any movement talking about this? Because not even, like, Americans may know it either. I mean, we've just identified a <laughs> kind of a systemic problem of um, U.S. education, right? I mean, I think that these histories are not told. We tell these very particular exceptionalist narratives um, about, you know, kind of the righteous American march toward progress. And history is written by those in power. Um, and so we, our education system tends to leave out those stories and 
not mention how U.S. Uh, foreign policy impacts all these other um, um, countries. I mean, including causing migration. Dr. Valenzuela was mentioning, you know, U.S. economic policies, how this brought whole new, um, many more migrants um, to the United States. And so we tend to ignore those, um, the kind of U.S., how it's a cycle in terms of what we do and how that has all these impacts um, in different ways. So, I mean, I think there are great resources about there. There are many classes at Stony Brook, I mean, that, that teach um, these types of histories. Um, there are, um, you know, I know, um, you know, my kids are in, uh, one of my son's in high school, and I, I'm surprised he's actually learning some of these, you know, histories. So there are shifts, but I mean, I think what you're identifying is is something that, I mean, you all as students can kind of carry forward um, um, in terms of, you know, speaking about what you think needs to be taught um, in, the, in the future um, to, um, um, to, to students now and in the future. Uh, thank you so much for your comments. They're so important. Uh, we in the history department, I'll speak for my department, um, are constantly trying to make those webs of colonialism, imperialism, seen and known and evident. And um, of course we are doing it at the college level, seeing how those stories we tell about ourselves when they start, um, right? Those narratives um, that have been fashioned um, by the textbook industry, by people who are setting state regulations. My home state is Texas, and they are the at the center of trying to ban books, control content in textbooks, and it starts very early. Um, and going to your question about politicians and their knowledge of history, I think they bank on um, short memory and they want amnesia to work in their favor. Um, so the more that they can uh, discourage history from being disseminated, taught, produced, written, um, that is working to their advantage. Um, so something I would love to see uh, in my future years at Stony Brook is our curriculum constantly being decolonized. You know, I want to see indigenous languages being taught here. I want to see more classes that are reflecting the growing diversity of our students and these young migrants will come of age in the next few years and come to Stony Brook or might consider Stony Brook. I want it to be a place that um, does not seem like it's replicating the imperialism of the past. Uh, so I think your points are very well taken. Um, we're working hard to uh, to serve up that history that has been neglected and covered up. Yep. I think that, you know, Stony Brook, there are some courses out there that you might really be interested in. Thank goodness the History Department, Latin American Studies certainly is another avenue. Also, you've got HUS classes, class, HUS classes that are taught in English, okay, and the Spanish Department. And they, oftentimes, the themes uh, cover what you're talking about. So between all of these different departments, if you look, I think you can find, um, find courses. And I think it's all of our intentions, all of these departments' intentions to, to, to educate students because a lot of them haven't gotten this information from their high school uh, educations. And so it's a matter of kind of a wake-up call for them. And also, it's also a recognition for students like you that know of these histories and are, and, or perhaps have, are part of them. Women's and gender studies. <laughs> for kind of studies, there's a lot of great departments teaching work. Should we mingle? Should yes. We, yes. <laughs> we have, uh, thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, we have a wonderful reception waiting for you. Um, I would just like to, again, once again, uh, thank all of you for coming. And uh, I, I have to thank our library team for all, um, all of your help in putting this event together. It really takes a team. And um, there is, at the beginning, at the very beginning and end of the exhibit, are QR codes that are um, on the walls right now to take a short survey about the exhibit if you'd like to um, participate. So please, let's move to the reception area. Thank you very much. Hey, Rachel. John, thanks for putting up with the delay. No, no, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Oh, no, no. <laughs> this is the other club guy. Hi. This is Dennis. 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 That's my husband. John. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to meet you. Uh, John Fitzgerald. Oh, very Thank you. All, trust me, she's spoken very highly in my service. <laughs> a family knows her. And, uh, <laughs> very, very I've, kind I've of show. I've shared pictures of my mom yeah. with his mom. Uh -huh. <laughs> Anyway, it's very nice. I'm very happy. Oh, thanks. They say they got you get the map of Ireland. That's okay. That's okay. Both both my father, my parents from Ireland. Yeah, we were in a funeral last night. All Irish. So we talked about that. Yeah, right. All Irish. I mean, they were all. Well, you heard. That joke before, I'm sure. It's, what's the difference between a uh, Irish funeral and an Irish uh, wedding? About one last week. The the uh, <laughs> uh, preacher told that. Oh, really? of he, he, of course. <laughs> it's so cliche. You got to tell that, but, but gotta, it's funny. Yeah. You still laugh. <laughs> John, it's, right it's nice really meeting. very nice meeting. Yeah. Nice meeting you too. Oops, I hope you enjoyed that joke, folks. Signing off. I, I just told